Okay, so the answers for A and B look okay, but they say something weird for C. I don't know why. But again, if you're having difficulty, you can't remember how to do this, just have a look. Two rays is all we need to draw this. Okay? So one of them... Guys? Starts parallel and bounces off the mirror and goes where? Through, Through F. F. As straightly as you humanly can. Okay? And make it go a long way. So that little photon of light, that's the path it's going to take. Also, a photon of light from the top of this object, which is narrow, going through F will go where? Bounces off the mirror and just opposite of that will go parallel. So I did get a couple questions yesterday saying, well, okay, great, now what? Well, this light, one goes like that, one goes like this, this is where they converge. That's where the image will form. So this is the top. That's the arrow. It's there. Don't draw this. But again, how do you know if it's like this or like that? Yeah, good question. Because this photon at the bottom goes through F, hits the mirror, and then what? Goes parallel, which means right down this, what do we call this line? Principal axis. Or consider it the other one, too. Let's look at the other one. What if the one goes parallel to the mirror? It bounces through F. Well, it's right there. Okay? Think of it right here as just a plain mirror. You know what happens. It just goes straight. So that has to be where the bottom is. Somewhere on this principal axis is where the bottom of this object is going to be. And here, it happens to be there. So that's where this image is. I don't care about this wordage, but on a test, if it says if this is real or virtual, you got to pick real, okay? Because it's on the same side of the mirror as the object. These light rays do actually converge. I could project this on a screen. Attitude, is this upright or inverted? It's inverted. You know it is now, okay? Because this, I just told you why the bottom is. So that is inverted, not upright or erect, as some other textbooks will call it. Magnification. If you drew it correctly, there should be no ifs, ands, or buts here. It's pretty clear that this thing is bigger. It's larger, yeah. Okay, and position, all this says is, I don't care about it, but it's beyond C. It's past C. Well, there's the position, okay? It's right there. C is the center of curvature, right? Essentially, if that thing was a circle, then that's the center of the circle, okay? But like I said, really good mirrors aren't necessarily spherical. Cheap ones are. The really good ones are parabolic. They're a lot more expensive to produce. But there is actually this image, if this was a nice sphere, it wouldn't, like it wouldn't be as sharp as it could be. You'd see it there, but a nice parabolic mirror, it would be very, very nice. Anyway, you don't need to know that. Okay, um, there's that one. Let's look at another one. And this one, a picture is worth a thousand words. Which one is this? Keep going, keep going. Page 7C on 224. Next one, right here. And these you're supposed to draw, okay? You draw your own mirror, the principal axis, here's F, and if one is two focal lengths away, well, there's one focal length, there's two focal lengths, more than that, that's where you want to draw your object, and then you see what happens, okay? And it looks like it's right there. Um, this is the one I want to concentrate on, though, because it's kind of hard to draw it. So let's have a look at this guy. Yep. The line of the arrow end on the print. Let's look at, well, I, I lost my picture. You mean here? Well, 
Well, in my notes, yes, you're right, I did. Okay? So this one, if it was... That one would have a tail hanging up over here. It would be smaller, okay? But if your arrow is like that, like I said, this part of that one tiny photon from this area bouncing straight on the mirror, it will come right back and it shouldn't have a tail here, okay? Yeah. But, yeah, okay. All right? Um, so, whoop, that's not the one I want. That's not the one I want. That's the one I want. This guy. So this is what happens, okay? This is this little line you see here, that's F. And all these light rays, if this guy, who's right on the line, so you see the tail of this image is also right on the line, okay, way past C, that's what happens. It's inverted and it's smaller, but as I get past C here somewhere, it's inverted and larger. What happens if it's right on F? All these photons bouncing off this concave mirror, where does it look like they're going to converge? Do these lines look parallel? Are they ever going to cross? Trick question. No image. Okay? Correct. Essentially, it actually, you can argue it's going to be one dot right there. That's going to be the image. There's the bottom photon. It basically goes straight at the mirror and bounces back. This isn't exactly zero degrees, but it's pretty close. That's as close as I can get it, right? And the one at the top bounces there parallel and goes right through that dot too. So you can argue this actually does have an image. It's just going to be one little speck right at F, but you're not going to see whatever this object is. Okay? Here's just a line, but if it's an arrow, it's not going to appear anywhere. And then as we go inside F, okay, that is now not a real image, a virtual. Because those, you know this is a mirror. How on earth can that light get behind the mirror inside the wall? It doesn't. It's a virtual image. All you need to remember is if the image appears on the opposite side of the reflecting surface as the object, that means virtual. Okay, and it's always going to be larger. Okay, that's your magnifying mirror. This is you looking at your mirror, and you see yourself on the other side a lot bigger. You want more detail. Okay, so that's that. So at the focal point, new image. All right, convex, I promised to do. That's back here a bit, because I didn't do it yesterday. And this one, you don't need a heck of a lot of notes. It's a lot easier than a concave one. Okay, so convex because... No, it's just, well, it's right in your book. This is page 219. Yeah, it's notes, but it's not on paper. It's just in your book. What's the other word for a convex? Someone say it. Con diverging. Not converging. Diverging. Have you seen this word before? It's in the Science 8 curriculum, but you may not have done it, or you may not remember if you did so these light rays, unlike the other one, they don't converge at some spot here and make a real image. All the light coming to this convex, they all diverge. Okay, this light ray is never going to cross this one. The one right down the principal axis bounces right back. These are never going to cross. They diverge. Okay? But what happens if you're looking at an image? This is kind of complicated, but this light ray looks like it's coming from F. It goes into F, okay? This one headed towards F bounces back parallel. And because it's virtual, they dot this. This isn't a real image, it's a virtual image. That's why it's dotted. 
It's not actually there. You can't project it on a screen, but it looks like that's where it is. So there's another word for convex mirror, well, diverging, but some people call it this. Okay, you've seen these in some grocery stores and that, way up in the corner. Okay, because it enables you, if you're over here, you can see around the whole store. So I should, if I stuck one behind Carmen over there, I could see what she's looking at on her phone right now. Actually, that's a good idea. I should, actually, I should even wire in a camera and feed it to her mom and dad so they could see 24-7 what she's doing in class. That would be awesome. Anyway, security mirror, that's convex, okay? It's always, can I bring this towards you? Your image is always what? Upright or right side down? Upright. And it's always, doesn't matter how close I bring it, it's always going to be smaller, okay? Just like, not that picture. But this one, it's always going to be upright and smaller, just in varying degrees depending how far away or close this is. Okay, so that one's a lot easier to understand than concave. Okay. Oh, mom's watching her right now. Go walk out of the classroom. Okay, page 227. Let's go back and revisit Snell's Law Sec. Did I hear a groan? No. So I gave you some questions on Snell's Law. It's on the previous page. Does that look like another formula? Is that on the back of your book? Yep. <laughs> So index of refraction, I showed you this table. I told you that we take how fast does light go in a vacuum, i.e. space, where there's nothing for it to hit. We take that as an index of one. Everywhere else, it's slower. Okay. What is the speed of light? Does anyone remember? Okay, but only in one medium. So now we need to be a little more precise. It travels at different speeds depending on what it's going through. Speed of light in a vacuum is 3 times 10 to the 8. This is a formula that will tell you the speed depending on what material it's in. Okay, N being the index of refraction. So they've done this by experiment. They actually put light through glass how fast did it go? How much did it bend? What's the index of it? Okay, so for example, how fast? Well, not C. Yeah, C. Light through a diamond. Like I said, you can do a whole course on this. It's kind of cool. For a diamond, I know what's the index of refraction? 2.42. I want to solve for V here, right? So I said C in a diamond. It is light, but I know in a vacuum it goes 3 times 10 to the 8. Okay, what is V? So there's only three variables here. N is C over V. I want to solve this thing for V, so cross multiply the N and the V, just swap them, just like you did in uh, trigonometry in grade 10, right? Okay, if you want to do it the long way, feel free. 3 times 10 to the 8 over 2.42, and what do we get? Should it be something bigger than 3.10 to the 8? 3 times 10 to the 8 or something less? Yeah, absolutely, it should be slower, right? That's as fast as it can ever get, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters a second. Divided by 2.42, and what's that? A number. 1.2 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, so that's... It doesn't like to write right on the edges. 
quite a bit slower than in a vacuum. Like approximately, come on. Only 40% is fast, right? That's substantially slower, isn't it? Slower. So it slows down quite a bit in a diamond, and that's why this is highly desirable to certain members of society, <coughs> like women. When they put one on their finger, the light actually comes in, refracts twice, and comes back out again. That's why it looks like it sparkles. Okay? It slows down quite a lot, enough for in a tiny little stone, the light that comes in bounces right back to your eye, depending on the quality of the diamond and the quality of the cut of it. Okay, it does it more so or less so. So anyway, that's another formula for you. You're going to get a couple questions like that. One other application of Snell's law. Something called the critical angle. So have a look-see here. Okay, here's my laser. I can move it around. Right now it's in air. You know N's one for air. Okay? And it's going into water. So if I click on my laser, what's going to happen? It's going to refract towards the normal because this is a denser medium than that one. Now some of it actually does reflect as well, right? So that's why you're seeing a little beam here. And you see, of course, the angle, the, the law of reflection says this angle, incident angle, is always equal to the angle of refraction. So you can kind of visually look at that. And I could even pull up my protractor here and prove it. But the refraction angle goes into the water. Now what happens if it's the same medium? Then using your formula, you could prove, well, there's no refraction at all. And that should kind of make sense, right? From water into water, it's not going to bend. It's moving at the same speed. It doesn't refract. But what happens if I go from air into water and I increase this... Whoop, that's not what I want to do. If I go from water to air, rather, there is a point where I get to what's called the critical angle and where's the refraction? It doesn't happen. Have you been looking at some of the questions I might give you? Yeah, there's sometimes, depending on what angle you look in the water, there could be something in the water you don't even see because the light doesn't hit your eye. Okay? <clears throat> This is the critical angle. Calculate the critical angle. So this is now upside down to the picture I just showed you, but there is some angle of incidence where this light ray does not go into the air. If you're up here, okay, you can't see maybe this fishy. Okay, because this angle is too big. So how do we determine what that angle is for water? Well, we can use Snell's Law, which says the index of incidence times the angle of incidence is the index of refraction times the angle of refraction. But what do I know here? I'm trying to solve for what angle is the critical angle for water. So what is the index here where it came from? It's in water, which is 1.33. And what medium is it going into for refraction? It's air, where N is 1. What is my angle here? What is my refracted angle if this ray goes right down here? That's just a right angle, isn't it? 
Isn't that 90 degrees? Who remembers the sine of 90? It is 1. Yeah. Okay, so I got 1 times 1. If you don't believe me, put it in your calculator. Divide both sides by 1.33. And the critical angle is the inverse sine of, once you're in degrees, one divided by 1.33, which is 48.8 degrees. For water, that's what it is. Anything greater than 48 degrees here, and you're not going to see that object. Now, do I sound kind of excited about this? Do we care about critical angle? First, let me just show you here. Does that look like about 48 degrees? Oh, I'm still, hang on, I still got a corrected ray there. If I just hit it right there, look like about, looks like a 50, right? Close enough, plus or minus one degree. Why do I care about the critical angle? Why is that cool to kids like you and me? Because this is total internal reflection. Have you heard what this is? Maybe you've heard of these. Ah, how do you think fiber optics work? Total internal reflection. Okay, actually, let me write down the questions first, and then I'll show you a little video. So 2.30... One to three, two thirty-seven, one, two, four, and twelve. And then you remember that Snell worksheet I gave you? Five to seven on that. Okay. And I'll show you a little something on fiber optic. And then I actually I got
Upload speeds are also much faster with fiber optic broadband. To see if fiber optic broadband is available at your home or premises and just how fast it will be, visit our availability checker. Busy households can now have multiple devices all sharing the same connection at the same time without slowing each other. Okay. Sorry about that. It's the ultimate battle of the network and communication. This guy's a little hyper, but some of the information's okay. Which will win the ultimate bandwidth challenge and send his opponent's big cry home to God. Let's begin with the key characteristics of those good old reliable copper phone lines. That's right, the same basic infrastructure that we've been using since the beginning of the 20th century. Copper is highly conductive. This is what makes it so great for carrying the power to your home that you need to do all the things that are important that you need to do there. And copper wires use the movement of electrons to carry signals by modulating the waveform at one end, then demodulating it at the other end to convert the patterns in the waveform into an analog or a digital signal. A device that modulates and demodulates is called a modem. The problem is that copper, even higher bandwidth coaxial cables, can carry only a small number of waveforms, limiting its maximum data capacity. And these waveforms degrade very quickly as the distance between the communications devices increases. In fact, copper only has two main advantages today. One, it's much less expensive per unit distance than fiber, and two, it's already deployed basically everywhere. Thanks, telephone and television. Modern fiber optic cable, invented by Corning Inc. in the 70s, changed the game completely by allowing the use of light bursts to carry a signal instead of waves traveling through metal. Today, these cables are made up of a highly transparent, flexible glass core wrapped in a series of layers that protect both the integrity of the signal in the glass and the structure of the glass inside from the elements. Because this is light traveling through a nearly transparent medium, it moves at approximately 200,000 kilometers per second, actually not that different from an electrical signal through copper, um, but, but much more importantly, the integrity of the signal, the ease with which we can interpret the light on versus light off at either end, is much easier to maintain at higher switching speeds and over longer distances. I mean, we're talking thousands of kilometers, like across oceans giving fiber optic cables an enormous advantage in speed and, well, distance. There's lots of other cool stuff too. Optical signals are immune to electromagnetic interference. Individual fibers can be bundled together during installation, some for use now, others dark for expandability in the future, depending on the requirements. Lasers and an individual fiber might transmit multiple wavelengths or colors of light at the same time to be split out at the other end to further increase capacity. Sounds great. Let's use it for everything, Linus. Well, life is really that simple, isn't it? We're heading in that direction, but currently fiber is so much more expensive per length than copper that it's taking a little while to get there. It's not really the true now. Is that copper carries some additional <laughs> hidden costs that increase fibers appeal even further. Thicker, heavier cables are more difficult to install and may require more clearance than is even available in existing underground pathways. In cases where multiple connections can leverage a single backbone, the cost per capacity argument comes into play, where even if two fibers cost a thousand times what copper would, if it can carry over a thousand times the data, the cost per customer and ISP can serve goes down and of course, the distance thing comes into play again. The ISP will save again on repeaters that you'll need all over the neighborhood to maintain the integrity of a signal that's running on copper lines so Mrs. Rochester's connection doesn't drop out in the middle of her Netflix marathon. But that doesn't mean that every house will be getting a direct fiber connection anytime soon. It would certainly be nice, but hybrid deployments with a fiber backbone that serves many customers and copper runs to individuals for the last mile are most common today because they deliver solid speeds and reliability while saving a lot of money for the notoriously tight-fisted ISPs that are managing the infrastructure. Speaking of whatever it is I was just talking about, our sponsor today is Fractal Design. And instead of me telling you guys about their simple Scandinavian design and great pop. My name is John McFay, I'm from College, Mississippi. My name is Charlie. Talk real funny too. All right.
This can get a little technical, but... I find this fascinating object. It's a fiber optic cable for a stereo. Toslink is what it's called. Toshiba invented it. These cables are used to connect our world today and are capable of transmitting information across countries and oceans. The first, let me show you how it works. I have a bucket that I modified to the window in front. And on the other side, I put a stop in this hole right here. I have a bottle of propylene glycol, which is a little bit of cream in it. A ring stand. Now, keep your eye on this part when I turn the lights. Come on, video. There we go. That's what it's like. The light follows the liquid flow all the way to the bucket. Amazing. It does this because of total internal reflection. As the light enters the stream, it is reflected as soon as it hits the interface between air and liquid. You can see here the first reflection, and then the second, and the third. This occurs because there's a difference between the index of refraction of the guide material, here, propylene glycol, and the outside, air in this case. Recall that any time light strikes a surface, it can either be absorbed by the material, reflected from it, or pass into and through it, the latter we call refraction. It's easier to see from a top view. Reflection and refraction can happen at the same time, but if a light ray hits the surface at an angle greater than the critical angle, it will be completely reflected and not refracted. For this propylene glycol and air system, as long as a beam hits the surface at an angle greater than 44.35 degrees, measured from the normal, it will propagate down the stream with total internal reflection. To create this same effect in an optical fiber, engineers create a core of glass, usually pure silicon dioxide and an outside layer called cladding, which they also typically make from silicon dioxide, but with bits of boron or germanium to decrease its index of refraction. A 1% difference... That won't be on the test. Fiber work. To make such a long, thin piece of glass, engineers need a large glass preform, as simply as the pure core glass and the outside cladding. They then draw or pull a fiber by winding the metal onto a wheel at speeds up to 60 to 100 meters per second. Typically, these drawing powers are several stories tall. The height allows the fiber to cool before being wound onto a drum. One of the greatest engineering achievements was the first ocean spanning fiber optic cable. Called TAVI, it extended from Tuckerton, New Jersey, following the ocean floor over 3,500 miles until branching out to Whitmouth, England, and Palmer, France. Engineers designed the cable carefully to survive on the ocean floor. At its center lies the core, less than a tenth of an inch in diameter, it contains six optical fibers wrapped around a central steel wire. They embedded this in an elastomer, pushing the fibers, surrounded with steel strands, and then sealed it inside a copper cylinder to protect it from water. The final cable was less than an inch in diameter, yet it could handle some 40,000 simultaneous phone calls. The essence of how they send information through a fiber optic cable is very simple. I could have a prearranged signal with someone at the other end. Perhaps we'll use Morse code, and I just block the laser so that the person at that end sees flashes that communicate a message. To transmit an analog signal like voice from a phone call along the cable, engineers use pulse code modulation. We take an analog signal and cut it up into sections and then approximate the wave's loudness or amplitude as best we can. We want to make this a digital signal, which means discrete values of loudness and not just any value. For example, I'll use four bits, which means I have 16 possible values for the loudness. So the first four sections of the signal can be approximated by about 10, 12, 14, and 15. We then take each section and convert its amplitude to a series of ones and zeros. The first bar of value 10, when encoded, becomes 1, 0, 1, 0. We can do this for each section of the curve. Now, instead of looking at the green waveform or even the blue bars, we can think of the signal as a series of ones and zeros organized by time. And it is that sequence that we send through a fiber optic cable, a flash for a one and nothing for a zero. Of course, the exact method of encoding is known at the receiving end, so it is a trivial matter to decipher the message. Now, you may be wondering how a laser pulse can travel nearly 4,000 miles across the ocean. It does it without some help because the light will escape from the sides of fibers. Look back at our propylene stream. Here's how the light attenuates as it travels. You can see here a narrow beam in the bucket that broadens a bit when it enters the stream. 
And then after the first thousand. Okay, the rest we don't really care about. But isn't that funny? You heard digitals all ones and zeros. Goes in that way and it comes out the other end and we watch a hockey game. One fiber optic strand about the size of your hair can carry hundreds of high definition television channels. And you would need about that much copper to do the same thing. Okay, it's just, you know. Thankfully, someone invented it, so you get a lot better TV. One million telephone calls can do it. So if I hit that through here, this is like a fiber optic. I get total internal reflection. And you guys see the end being red there? And you can actually, if it's dark enough, you can see it bouncing off the sides all the way to the end and coming out there. Hey, that's fiber optics. This is just plastic. Not, whoop, makes someone blind. It's just some kind of a plastic, but it still works.